so in this session I'm mainly going to cover like the high level of you know how to find a direction how to communicate that direction and how to work with different processes and then next time I'll talk more about how to get the best from a team of artists how to play to people's strengths so you guys are all creating artwork that falls into one of these general categories um, but each one, while the artwork looks very, very similar uh, and has a very similar process, the, the design purpose of that artwork is very different. And that's the key part of, um, of art directing, is understanding what the purpose of the art is in the first place. Um, so they tend to fall into one of three types. So concept art is nearly always heavy on design focus. It's going to become usually a 3D model or some sort of product further down the line. So you really got to be thinking about construction, how this communicates to the next person down the, down the line who's going to be building this, what this object is going to be. There's also usually a lot of, um, of idea iteration. Uh, and so, you know, staying fast and loose is a really important thing at the beginning. And then illustration work, again, it's the very same tools you use every day, Photoshop, you know, you're painting, but the purpose is very different. You know, illustration is often about communicating um, uh, a story, a kind of, um, a, you know, whether that be for a character or a location. It's also sometimes about the quality. I mean, quality sells products. And, you know, in some ways illustration, that the higher the quality of the illustration, the more sort of impact it's gonna have with the viewer. And then on to marketing art, I mean, that's taking the whole, the whole sort of quality bar to that next step. And really, marketing art is not, it is about a story, but actually it's about a product. It's about an experience that the, the user's going to have. You know, it's, it's, it's summarizing to the viewer, what am I going to get when I, when I play this, when I invest in it? So, so when, before you start any piece of art, whether it's a game or, a, a, you know, a, a book or or even just an image that you're doing for yourself, you really need to think about what are you trying to achieve with this image? And you know, here at, at work at Atom Hall, we're obviously trying to achieve um, the client's goals in most cases. But even with your own personal work, you know, you have that urge to paint something, but what are you actually trying to achieve with it? Are you trying to prove a new skill that you've learned? Are you trying to, um, you know, if you've got a portfolio of work and you're trying to fill a gap in that portfolio, what, what is that gap that you're trying to fill? Who does it need to influence? So obviously for us, we're trying to influence our clients. We're trying to influence the, the people our clients are trying to influence. Again, in your personal work, you know, what are you trying to attract with this? Is this a piece that you're putting out there for other artists to see and, you know, give feedback? Or is it something that you're just trying to do for yourself? And then how will you make this art? So that's the process by which you're going to make the artwork. Um, and then what is the quality bar you need to hit? And that, that quality bar question is something that I think anyone who's art directing has that, that almost that challenge there where most artists are constantly pushing to do the best finished work they can possibly do. And actually, when you're art directing, the goal is much bigger than the individual piece of work. So, so you're kind of pushing the artist in some ways to say, yeah, that's actually good enough, wrap it up, it's done, because it, it fulfills its purpose. The bigger purpose is actually the goal. Um, so, typical creative process, and like whether this is going on in a studio, or whether it's going on in your head, this is actually pretty much sums it up. So when you work on a piece of work for yourselves, you are in some ways creating your own brief in the form of an idea, then you're thinking to yourself, hmm, what shall I paint? And then you're thinking, oh, I know what to paint. And then you do some sketches, and then you tend to think, actually, these sketches look a little bit crap. And then you think I'll do a few more. And you start to get into it, and over time, you iterate in feedback on yourself. And whether you post things to ArtStation or not, you're still getting feedback. Uh, and then you finalize the image. And when you're... <laughs> When you're guiding a team, they go through that whole sort of emotional roller coaster of, you know, thinking, yeah, this is going to be great, actually hitting the challenges of how do we deliver this, then 
quite often people go through a phase when they look at their own work and they think, actually, this is shit. You know, I'm not feeling it. This, di this project isn't going in the right direction. What am I going to do? And then you start to think maybe you're shit and so on and so forth. But actually, you know, the art director's role is quite often to, to understand that this is the pattern that everybody's going to go through and then get them through that uh, so that they get to this other side where they start to think, yeah, this is awesome. So somebody has to drive purpose, whether it's, whether it's you yourselves thinking about your own work or whether it's in a team. And in our case, a lot of the time, the, the AD is actually the client. So the client has specified the brief, the, the client has specified the quality bar that we need to hit. Um, and for internal projects, that can either be me or it can be one of the principals, it can be Dan. Um, but somebody is, is the, the, the starting point of the, the idea. And then that then feeds into the rest of the team. So, so client AD work goes through production just to make sure that they're not smoking <coughs> crack on the way. And, then, <laughs> and it goes to a lead senior and the leads and the seniors will then uh, take the initial idea from the client AD, turn it into something that is um, producible and then filter it out to the rest of the team. So just a few basics before we get into this. The key, the key parts of coming up with a direction for a team, really center around style, theme, and genre. So to explain this further, if you think about it, the artist Banksy, you guys all familiar with Banksy, yeah? So Banksy is working in the genre of street art. Um, and his style is the stenciled sort of uh, spray paint work that he does. And then the theme is those bleak social statements he makes. So everything he ever puts up there is always kind of slightly, you know, uh, making a statement about uh, politics or about life in general. And it's the same when, when we come to look at our own art and our own projects. So if you think about it, in a, in a game, the genre is whether or not it's an RPG or a first person shooter or a platformer. And in a film, it's like rom-com, you know, action, adventure, thriller. And then your genre is kind of like taken off to one side when you start to thinking about the art because actually art uh, style and theme can be anything within that genre. But style and theme are actually quite heavily intertwined and it can be quite hard to sort of pick the two apart. So style is like the proportions you use, the colors, the details, the materials, the outlines, and then theme is the setting, you know, the time period. Is it sci-fi? Is it historical? Um, looking at like costume, you know, what are the themes within the costumes, technology levels. And once you start to understand your theme and your style, you can start to describe it. So the big difference between what goes on in your heads when you are directing your own work is that all of this <coughs> thought process is completely transparent to you. You're just, in some ways, you might not even be thinking about it. You just painting away and art is coming out of your hands. But actually to then get a team to be able to follow a direction, you have to be able to communicate um, what you're actually trying to achieve. And, and that's this next section is really understanding your theme. So for this, for example, we use is is not statements. And on a sliding scale, you have, you know, this is not bright and cartoony, this is dark and dangerous. And you can kind of start to communicate where this idea of yours sits uh, within timeline. Should we stylize the project? I mean, actually, you know, stylization makes a project stand out. So if you think about um, that game, oh, the black and white game with the little boy. Limbo. Limbo. So you think about Limbo. That was pretty much one of the first games to hit the mainstream that was black and white. But it made such a statement because it had a unique style. And also for gameplay, you know, obviously there's readable archetypes or a main play of a uh, uh, mainstay of game design. Escapism as well. People don't always want to play a game in a gritty world. Sometimes they want to actually experience something that is very different. And then screen size and power. You'd be surprised how often that actually is what influences um, a game stylization is actually, if you're doing it on a mobile device or on a tablet, you can't do photo real, so you have to stylize and, and therefore you can make a compelling experience for somebody using stylization. And also when it comes to abstract concepts, so you know a lot of games have 
pretty crazy stuff happening in them. And if you, if you have a very realistic world, a very realistic art style, and you do crazy things, it, it can suddenly become very unbelievable. So the more, the more abstract your game concepts are, the more abstract the art really needs to be to go with it. And then age range appeal as well. You know, kids are attracted to simpler and more vibrant art styles. So in proof, The Simpsons would look disgusting if it was in a realistic style. So looking at a classic example of stylization in game design, you know, instantly recognizable archetypes, bright colors, um, you've got quite a lot of value patterning there as well to determine the different sort of values you see and, and recognizable shapes within those characters. And then at the opposite end of that spectrum, you've got hyperrealism. Um, and that's when you take the sort of little key things that human beings look for when they think about what is real and you ramp them up. So it's, for example, shininess and you know, uh, physical details, um, heightened reality. But the problem with going down the route of photorealism is actually everything within the whole experience has to hit that bar. So you can't have like stills, for example, that look photoreal when the animation can't match up with that. Uh, and likewise, you know, even things like the music, if you're going to do something that's very realistic, you've got to have some pretty high quality music as well. So the whole thing has to be together. And you see so many times products feel, fall into that uncanny valley because um, they couldn't hit that standard across the whole, the whole project. So then that leads us to, to using stylization and realism together. Um, and this is, this is a great way to sort of play to the kind of strengths of the technology that we have these days and also um, create something that is a little bit more, has a little bit more leeway from a stylization point of view. So taking details um, and making them very real and then taking form and making that quite stylized, that works really well. So that's the basics, high level goals, what are we trying to achieve, who are we trying to influence? <coughs> when you think about who we're trying to influence, this is actually you know, at the very core of every project, whether it's a movie or a TV show or a game, this is what you think about first, because actually this is what allows you to make money from what you're about to create. And so if you're creating a product for people who don't have any cash or, or don't exist, there's no point in making it. Um, so are we making it for these guys? Are we making it for these guys? Are we making it for these guys? I mean, it's actually shown that quite a lot of people, quite a lot of older people these days are gaming. It's definitely a market there. Or are we doing something a bit more niche? The Harry Potter crowd? <laughs> <laughs> and when you're planning this kind of um, thing out, you, the way to do it is usually to create uh, something like this. So this is possibly the most unsexy graph I've ever created but it plots out when we were working on Dust 514 where Dust fits within that kind of sci-fi uh, product placement and we looked at all of these different things that were out at the time and the idea is that you try and find a space that is is not overly crowded um, but still has potential um, customers in it and you can even do this when you think about it with your own work you know, you might be fans of certain artists who you really like their stuff, but you also don't want to be a me too. So you can kind of map out where they sit on a, on a scale like this and then work out where you want to be in that space. And that's one of the steps you can make to creating your own style is like this, but not like this. Um, and then once you've figured out where the product is going to go, you can start to think about what's your artistic target. So, um, so for this one, this is um, for the, the pitch for the, the Thing game that we were looking at a few years ago. And we were looking at different horror games that, had, that were in this space. Um, and again, we looked for an area that was fairly empty and, and targeted that in specific. So then once you've defined where your project is gonna be roughly in that space, how do you then go about defining that style? And the truth is, it's a lot of hard work and iteration. You know, it's rare that someone just puts pen to paper and finds the style just like that. Quite often you have to do a ton of 
you know, as you've seen with some of the projects we've had in, in the studio, so much of the work is not actually the final image. It's the journey that you have to go through to get to that final image and the steps that you have to explore and then potentially throw away before you find uh, the good stuff. So this is one that, um, that Colin did a while ago and it's taking this girl, Emily, all the way through from being, you know, a fairly believable kind of character right through to super abstract, you know, almost sort of um, children's cartoon uh, sort of in style. And then once you found that style, how do you then communicate it to a team? So one of the ways I've done it in the past is to actually create a range finder of, a same, of the same character and say, okay, this is, this is too realistic, this is too stylized, this is the sweet spot in the middle, and create a number of objects like a character, a vehicle, a prop, each of those being on a scale of three styles and that's a way to communicate um, where we fit. And then you can get into way more complicated range finders. So, so this one I actually um, stole from Skip Kimball, uh, <laughs> who was the art director on, uh, on Project Spark for a while. Um, and this is looking at how two opposing worlds, so we have the void and we have Eden, um, fit in with each other, and then how they fit in between sort of traditional and abstract and positioning different products along that line and then working out where the product that we're working on is going to fit. And I think um, this is usually where you're sort of mixing in a little bit of that, that sort of uh, product positioning and also art style positioning into, into one uh, range finder. And again, looking at, at characters, so there's almost a little bit of psychology in this one if you think about it. You know, there's the expected hero on the left what every kid wants to be. And then on the right, you have the unexpected hero, what every kid actually feels like. And you know, on the right, you have like Wally, totally unexpected hero. He's a little dude, he's like all worn out. You know, he has no strength, but he has strength of character. And that's an internal uh, sort of power. Whereas on the left-hand side, it's all about muscle and proportions and swords, and it's, it's the external focus of power. And it's working out where you want to be on that psychological scale with the, with the consumer, you know, what are we aiming at? What are we trying to bring out in them? Um, so yeah, so it's, it, you know, you can start to add all sorts of different, different tangents into this stuff. And then going back to really simple is, is not reference sheets. So this is um, one we used for uh, a project I art director called Necessary Force. And the idea was that this is the future, but this is the future as perceived from the 1980s. And that was this sort of style hook. So the year is sort of 2030, but it's not all like iRobot kind of, you know, X-Men sort of super ergonomic vehicles. It's, it's the future as it would have been from Mad Max or like, you know, Escape from LA or something like that. And then another great is, is not reference sheet, you know, character costumes, you know, in this particular instance, we were trying to communicate that we're not going for that kind of almost like cheesy 90s, lots of neoprene kind of suits. We're trying to focus on believable materials and, um, and sort of a more sort of classy style, less is more kind of feel. And you can blend themes and styles. So for example, you can take industrial steampunk, mix it with Victorians, and you end up with the order. Uh, and that's a very good example of a game where they mixed different themes and different styles to create something. And you can take it even further than that. You can actually take <laughs> some quite bizarre stuff, like mixing genres, themes, beliefs, history, mix the whole thing together, and you end up with Star Wars. If you think about it, it is exactly that. It's World War II, mixed with the telling of the Bible, mixed with spacemen. And it works. So exploring different things that you can bind together can often really help you find a style. So then once you've sort of thought about this style and how you're going to communicate it, what are the, what are the requirements um, that you need from the team to be able to deliver on this? So some general, general design goals is always to think about shape language. And I think depending on where you train as an artist kind of determines how much importance you put into this. 
But when you look at it, actually, all of the greatest character designs and even the greatest sort of pieces of industrial design all put a lot of importance <coughs> on shape language. Uh, so this is some stuff from Disney. Uh, and you, know, you can see in Aladdin, each of the characters had a very specific silhouette. Um, and then taking that into color, you know, for example, in this uh, image that Vic did in the top, each of those characters has very unique shape language. Each of those characters is using a unique primary color. So they all stand out in a lineup. They're what I would call really well designed characters. And that even applies to realistic characters as well. So if you look at the Dead Island lineup, um, bottom right, while each of them is, is a human being and they're in realistic proportions, they're actually quite extreme in their size and build. So, you know, um, this lady in the middle, She's very petite. The lady on the right is more sort of um, physically built. And also when you look at their color usage, they all have like a signature color and actually you could pretty much break them into, into blocks of color and you would still recognize them as the Dead Island lineup. And then looking at value patterning. So the eye looks for boundaries of contrast. And using contrast is, is a great way to create those sort of um, subshapes in your shape language. So when you're designing a character, for example, the character has their silhouette, but you also have almost a pattern within that silhouette that then reinforces that character even further. Um, so if you look at these images on the top, all of the contrast is in the head. Uh, and then as you go to the bottom of the body, it's pretty much like a low contrast neutral color. And that's because the focus it needs to be all on the head. Um, and then relief space as well. So that, that's using contrast in the upper body with relief space in the lower body. Using desaturated color as well. So focusing all the, the, you know, the sort of more saturated, hotter colors in the key areas of focus, desaturating out away from that. Um, and I think what we often see in artwork is when we have too broad a use of high contrast detail and a lot of saturated colors, the image just starts to look like some crazy busy patchwork quilt. And then you can actually take all of that out of characters and apply it to everyday you know, objects like space weapons and uh, looking at environments as well. I mean, this, this environment from Kill Zone that we did, great use of shape language. It all funnels us through to the, the, uh, the key viewing point, but also has a number of different signature shapes within there. And I think the other main thing about environments and shape language is it, particularly in games, um, people need to be able to orientate themselves in the world. And so if you don't have recognizable shapes in the environment, it's very hard to pe for people to know which way around they're facing, where they are. So then moving specifically onto characters. So <coughs> character silhouette should be clearly identifiable at first glance. The characters should be designed with a pose in mind. So this is always a tricky one, right? Some, some people, some clients and some artists think that you should design a character in a T-pose. And actually the biggest problem with that is that's great for a costume, but when you're designing a character, you're not just designing what they're wearing, you're designing their attitude, you're designing their power, their weakness, you're designing everything that goes with that. And so really, finding the right pose to then sell the design work that you're doing is really important. And you know, it's almost something that we see time and time again where you look at the actual character design and you go, yeah, it's pretty cool. And the client doesn't go for it because the pose doesn't sell who that character is. So the two things go hand in hand. Um, and then also where the character is gonna be part of a lineup, you've also got to think about the lineup itself and it can really help to actually do like a quick sort of sketch lineup of, you know, six shapes, like with the Aladdin uh, example that I showed, just to define where each of these characters fits in a hierarchy and then start to design the character. And then going into costume. So, so this is the kind of time where T-pose, you know, is, is fine and this is where you want to do it. Um, but the, again, going back to the purpose of the artwork. So, so now that we're getting into a costume design, purpose shifts the purpose is all about the the costume itself and so the pose now needs to sell the costume and not who the character is 
And again, like looking at, at sub shapes within that design, I mean, if you actually look at this, you look at the value patterning, there's quite a lot of different values in here that Charlie's put into this image that allow you to pick out the edges of things to understand the shape. And then also, if you actually were to take this and break it down, you can always chop it into one shape, two shapes, you know, there's probably eight shapes there that make up that character, uh, which make it very readable. And then for props, you know, this is going to be a 3D model now. So suddenly the focus changes again. The focus becomes all about form and about materials and about color. Everything that can inform the 3D artist as to what they're going to be doing um, using this artwork for. Um, and again, like, you know, line work suddenly becomes really important and even possibly building this as a 3D proxy model becomes important because then you prove to yourself that actually this works as a 3D model. It's not just a, you know, an abstract speed paint. <coughs> so architecture. I mean, I always think that architecture should tell a story. And when you, whenever you look at the greatest sort of um, locations in the world, if, you know, when you go to them or even when you go to, um, even when you see things in movies and in games, the, the ones that resonate are the ones that you look at and you immediately start questioning what the backstory is for this location. How was it made? Who built it? What was going on at the time? And, um, and I think that's really important. You know, your, your environment is, is basically telling a story every time. But gameplay quite often has to define the space. And I think that is something that, you know, again, like artists are often trying to make great art, but that bigger picture view is usually the, the space where the art director has to work. So it's kind of like, how does this actually apply to the product we're trying to make? Um, is this going to work for gameplay? And the number of times, you know, for those of you who've worked on game environments here where you've done a really amazing picture and we've had to pull it all to pieces because from a gameplay point of view, it isn't going to work. You know, you know that pain, it, 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 it's really important at the beginning. Um, must be easy, easily readable, key places to orientate them, themselves, and for production art, must be readable for 3D modeling. But then we step back. So I'm talking about goals and, and what is the purpose of the art. And I think um, every artist wants to make a great piece of art, but actually, sometimes great doesn't mean a really detailed you know beautifully finished image it is actually great means it hit the purpose that we needed it to hit and i think you know hopefully you, you guys will eventually get your own chances to art, to art direct different projects and you'll realize at that point that um, certain pieces of art serve a purpose within a, a pipeline and once they're done it establishes the the vision for everybody else in that group and then the art has kind of passed through it's finished it doesn't need to do anymore so for these ones for example <coughs> these are composition sketches uh, I think the top one was it you Charlie or, or Vic so all that that image has to do is establish to the client where everyone is sitting in that room it doesn't have to have any detail it doesn't have to have any any lighting and actually when you add more detail to an image like this you can detract from the, the purpose of the image in the first place so what happens is you, you start to show people something that is um, more detailed than this and they start to get hung up on the details rather than focusing on the purpose itself which was to determine how everything is laid out in the scene. And again with this sketch on the bottom, what we wanted to work out with that is how does this village sit on the edge of a lake? That is all it's trying to do. And we needed a road to go through it on the edge of the lake. There was no further need to, to detail it anymore and again with um, with speed paints like the whole purpose of this image is to get across the look the feel the composition um, and to get the client to sign off on on the general storytelling of these images so we totally skipped color skip all of that stuff just get on with the purpose which is to iterate on on the composition and then almost going in the opposite direction, with this image, we were trying to capture the, the magic of our hero, our heroine, which is this little girl who gets lost in a forest, beautiful forest, and finds this gentle giant who becomes her friend. Um, 
this image is all about communicating that emotion, that wonder, the proximity of the characters together. You know, she's so open, she's looking upwards. He's totally chilled out, he's looking down at her. There's no need for any detail in this. You know, it was a super quick emotional painting just designed to capture. And it's funny as well, because when we, when we originally showed this painting to people, I think it was like two or three hours of work, but it absolutely, everyone was just like, oh, I, I totally feel, I feel this, which is really important as well. And again, another similar painting, you know, a few hours worth of work from Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, but, you know, as, uh, as James Gunn tweeted himself about this one, this was kind of like for him a big sort of uh, inspiration point when he saw this image. It got him thinking about this scene and how he was going to pull it together. And then bringing it all together. So, you know, this is typical mainstay of our work. Sketches, defining it, defining it, model sheet, final color. So how do we, how do we communicate these goals then to a team overall? So once we've done all of these, all of these explorations and kind of figured out where we are, usually we then pull together an art style guide. So this is an example, I, I'll send it around uh, after, I've, after I've talked about it, but it's really just bringing together all of the ideas that you have so that when you bring on a lot more uh, artists onto the team, they can all read through this and kind of catch up with the exploration that you've done and, and normally your core team has done. So again, like product positioning, you know, what it is, is not. Um, talking about key pillars. So a lot of clients, a lot of art directors assign a visual aspiration or a visual target to the, to the project they're working on. And then they also talk about the key pillars that then support that visual target. So for example, in this game, the visual uh, pillars are centered around, it's a horror game, right? So we want, we want realism. We want people to really see the horrible, you know, gore and blood that comes from this. Um, we want them to feel isolated. We want the environment to feel extreme, you know. Um, we want lighting to play to that realism. So we need really high contrast lighting to sort of play with all of those materials. Um, and we want to use a lot of, a lot of post-processing because in a lot of these kind of horror films, um, they mute down the colors in the scene and they, they use a lot of post-processing to kind of create that almost slightly kind of um, nightmarish kind of look to, to, uh, to the footage. And then again, like, you know, early concepts, concepts that failed and why they failed. It's really important, I think, to not only tell people um, what you want when you're directing them, but also should give them examples of what you don't want. Because I think it almost like then allows you to narrow down the space they're working in from both ends, like and dislike. And then, you know, the likes, exactly what it is that you like about these images. And then on to creative process. So, so creative process can literally make or break the, the budget. Uh, of a project and you know we've we've seen this ourselves in house you know we we think a piece of work is best suited to this creative process we go down that road and then we suddenly realize no it wasn't the right one and we burned a ton of time so establishing that in the first place is really important um, to use a great example of where creative per create process is different so on a movie for example um, because they're working with fixed booking times for actors and those actors are usually big names they they'll be assigned to a number of different movies throughout the year and they're filming on location you can't move their filming slot it's booked and so when they're making a movie they lock down the actors availability in the filming and then they design everything backwards from that point in time meaning that the concept art tends to happen in a window and that window is whatever happens whatever you've got at the end of that time that is what's going in the movie um, whereas with a game you've got loads more time particularly on a triple a game you know two three years stuff gets cut i mean the other thing as well with movies is you you can't just suddenly cut something because it's a linear story so if something didn't come out as you expected you've somehow got to make that still make sense whereas with a game 
you know, we've worked on loads of games where features got cut, whole things got moved, stories got changed at the, you know, in the month before the game ships. Um, and I think also as well, when you're working on these kind of projects, if you are art director, <coughs> you've got to kind of know what works for you and what's going to work for the team. So I genuinely believe like, if you, if you don't know what you want, but you have trust in the artist to, to do their thing and come up with cool stuff, then in some ways it's okay for you not to know what you want. You can kind of let the guys crack on and you can kind of cherry pick the ideas that are coming out of that process and you can pretty much build the direction as you go. Um, and <laughs> in some ways, if you don't trust the artist, but you do know what you're doing, then you can pretty much coach them through it uh, and they'll still get, come out with a good result. But I think the worst one is definitely when, you know, you don't know what you want, you don't trust the guys to find that either, and, uh, you know, everyone just gets unhappy. But you'd be surprised how many times it happens. Um, but I think, for me anyway, I, I really like to stick to a, a sort of traditional development process. I think it always yields a good result. So that's like um, exploring the ideas very loosely, super quick, you know, no more than a day's worth of work. And then, you know, defining it a little bit more, thinking about how it's going to move, thinking about its function, uh, starting to think about color, materials, um, and then moving to final. I think, I think once, you have, once you have a good understanding with the team you're directing, then it's probably okay to skip some of these steps because you're all in sync with each other. But when you're not synchronized yet, at the beginning of a project, you absolutely have to go through these steps because these are the steps that allow you to suddenly put the brakes on something that is going in the wrong direction and actually say no, you know, we can go back without burning too much time. So you guys have probably recognized this. This is the, the pattern that a lot of our projects take, you know, the staged process, going from the thumbnail through all of these different steps. Um, what's good about this process is, is I think when the AD knows what they want and they've given you a really solid brief, then it's actually really easy for the artist to follow. It's quite low stress. You just kind of go through the motions. Um, the downside is, is I think when the, when the AD doesn't know what they want or the brief is ambiguous, then you end up going through a ton of like iterations where you kind of think you're at the rough color stage and then you move through to the refined color stage and then suddenly they want to go back to sketches and thumbnails and it, it, it's pretty stressful, pretty demoralizing. So it's understanding that process again and again, sometimes it's actually better to, to just do a ton, of, a, a ton of exploration because that way you kind of, you've headed off all of the, the, the other directions you could go down. And um, I remember once talking to, I think, it was, um, I think it was Roberto actually here. We were saying about how the client ended up picking the first image that we created. And I was explaining to him that the thing is that the client wants to be sure that that is the best idea. So even if it is, you still have to go through all of these other iterations to prove that there wasn't something better out there. And that is really the whole the sort of process of, of developing an idea. So again, another staged example, you know, a number of sketches, refining them down, moving through, creating a final design. But then there is another way of doing it. And this is, I think probably my, my favorite way of working. Um, and I think we're actually starting to see a lot more people at the client side wanting this kind of process as well. So this is where um, we basically put a ton of ideas in at the top of a funnel, if you think about it that way. And then as we go, we combine and refine and munge all of these different ideas together down, a, down through the funnel until we end up with the final idea. And it's great fun, you know, it allows uh, a lot of exploration at a high level. It's ideal when the AD doesn't know what the, what the vision should be yet. Um, and it generates a ton of ideas. It also, from an art point of view, it instills a ton of trust in the team uh, as a group. And I think that can be really energizing for the artists working on the project. Um, and also as well, because you're letting the guys have a lot more freedom to do their own thing, a lot of great new ideas come out of that process as well. So I think the downside though is you've got to have somebody normally in production to um, 
organize who's going to do what, make sure there isn't any crossover between the work that different people are doing. And also, if there isn't somebody regularly reviewing the work and passing it down to the next stage, it can meander all over the place. And we've all been on those projects where we just seem to be painting the same asset over and over. So a great example of this convergence process. So this is Project Spark. I think we had like five or six different people work on uh, ideas for the Void King at the top. And then as we went, we funneled and funneled and funneled and actually, you know, different artists, maybe it wasn't playing to their strengths. So they moved off and did something else. And in the end, it kind of, all of the ideas got pulled together into a, a great final design. But there is one more way. And this is the, the method that I would normally use for a cash rich time poor project. So this is basically where you paint everything many, many times over, <laughs> all to a pretty good standard. Uh, because the person who's directing is often not actually available to give feedback or isn't involved in the project. And at the end of this process, you can put it all in front of them and they can just pick. And this works really well for movie projects because, <coughs> as I was saying, they don't have a lot of time. They're working to a, a time box. They just need whatever it is to, whatever it is that's available at the end of that period is the design that they go for. So it gets a lot done quickly. The artists get to self-direct. You get some unexpected ideas out of it. Uh, it reduces the AD's time. It's super expensive. Uh, it's very wasteful. Um, and it can get pretty demoralizing for the artists as well because actually 90% of the work they're producing just goes in the bin afterwards. So. so I think I've covered the high level. Next time I want to actually get into getting the best from the art team, you know, analyzing the art itself and giving feedback. Um, I'm always saying to people who, who give feedback, try to no matter whether you think the artwork is perfect or not, give it five minutes of your time and sit and look at it for five minutes, because actually, or even one minute, because it's very easy to sort of go, yeah, it looks cool, and then just shelve it. But it, because when you actually start to look at an image for a period of time, that's when everything that was in your head kind of empties out and everything that's in front of you starts to go in and you can actually pick things out. Now, cheers, <laughs>